While the likes of Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Edmund Kemper will always live in infamy, there are individuals currently out committing the most gruesome crimes against humanity. From the twisted minds of these killers to the relentless pursuit of justice, we shine a light on the terrifying reality of currently active serial killers and delve into the depths of their depravity. Brace yourself for a journey into the darkest corners of the human psyche. The River City Ripper. In the heart of Little Rock, Arkansas, a series of horrifying stabbings unfolded between 2020 and 2021, leaving the community in a state of fear and confusion. These seemingly random attacks claimed the lives of three innocent victims and left one wounded, as a single suspect wreaked havoc on the city. Despite the efforts of law enforcement, this elusive killer remains at large, casting a shadow of uncertainty over the community. The first murder occurred on August 24, 2020, when 64-year-old Larry Eugene McChristian was found stabbed to death on a stranger's porch. The brutal attack was captured on surveillance footage, but the killer's identity remained a mystery. Just a month later, on September 23rd, 62-year-old Jeff Welch was discovered dead on his front porch with a puncture wound to his neck, confirming the presence of a serial killer. After a period of silence, the city was struck by another wave of violence on April 11, 2021. Deborah Walker, a 41-year-old woman, was brutally attacked and stabbed 15 times. Miraculously, she survived her injuries providing crucial information about her assailant. Less than 24 hours later, 40-year-old Marlon Anthony Franklin was found stabbed to death, further solidifying the connection between the cases. The Los Police issue a safety alert after multiple knife attacks in the city. Three of those attacks have been homicides, and police believe they are all connected and now have a $20,000 reward for the suspect. The Little Rock Police Department, in collaboration with the FBI's behavioral analysis team, concluded that these chilling attacks were the work of a single offender. The killer targeted strangers walking alone in the early hours of the morning, between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. Despite increased police patrols and a $20,000 reward, the suspect remains at large, leaving the community on edge. Following the chilling murders in Little Rock, the police launched a relentless investigation to bring the perpetrator to justice. After the discovery of the fourth victim, Marlon Anthony Franklin, the authorities officially concluded that a singular offender likely committed these heinous crimes. This revelation sent shockwaves through the community as the realization dawned that a serial killer was at large. Despite the community's determination and the relentless pursuit of justice, the identity of the Little Rock serial killer remains a mystery. The case remains open, and law enforcement continues to follow leads and explore every avenue to apprehend the suspect. The city of Little Rock stands united, refusing to let fear define them as they await the day when the elusive killer will be brought to justice the West Mesa Bone Collector. A call to police led to the gruesome discovery of the remains of 11 women and one unborn child. Their bodies were in shallow graves, scattered across a 100-acre plot of land being prepared for development. Almost all of the women were Hispanic. All of them had connections to prostitution and drugs, and they had all been reported missing between 2002 and 2005. In the annals of unsolved crimes, few cases are as haunting and perplexing as the West Mesa murders. Between 2001 and 2005, the desolate desert of Albuquerque, New Mexico became the burial ground for at least 11 women. Their remains were discovered in 2009, sending shockwaves through the community and leaving law enforcement grappling with a mystery that remains unsolved to this day. Christine Ross, out for an evening walk, with her dog Ruka, stumbled upon a bone that resembled a femur. Uncertain of its origin, she took a picture and sent it to her sister, a registered nurse. The confirmation came swiftly. It was indeed a human bone. With that bone as the catalyst, a grim discovery unfolded. Detectives combed the West Mesa near 118th Street SW, unearthing 11 graves that held the remains of two teenagers and nine adults. The victims, most of whom were Hispanic females, had disappeared between 2001 and 2005. Their ages ranged from 15 15 to 32, their lives cut short in the prime of their youth. Among the victims were Jamie Barella, Monica Candelaria, Victoria Chavez, Virginia Cloven, Solania Edwards, Cinnamon Elks, Doreen Marquez, Julie Nieto, Veronica Romero, Evelyn Salazar, and Michelle Valdez. These names represent lives tragically taken, families left shattered, and a community forever scarred. What made the West Mesa murders even more chilling was the fact that most of the victims had links to sex work. This led investigators to believe that a serial killer, dubbed the West Mesa Bone Collector, was specifically targeting vulnerable women in this line of work. The investigation took a dark turn as law enforcement delved into the world of sex trafficking and the dangers faced by those involved. The Albuquerque Police Department, in collaboration with the FBI, launched a massive investigation 
investigation into the West Mesa murders. The FBI profilers joined the investigation, creating suspect profiles and analyzing the evidence. But despite their expertise, the killer remained elusive. Promising leads turned into dead ends, leaving detectives frustrated and the families of the victims desperate for answers. In an effort to break the case, the FBI offered a reward of up to $100,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible for the West Mesa murders. Yet, despite the substantial reward, the killer's identity remained a mystery. Today, the West Mesa murders remain unsolved. The West Mesa bone collector still roams free, leaving a trail of unanswered questions and shattered lives in their wake. But the fight for justice continues. The victims will not be forgotten, and law enforcement remains committed to solving this chilling mystery. Jeff Davis, Eight Killers. In the quiet town of Jennings, Louisiana, a series of unsolved murders sent shockwaves through the community between 2005 and 2009. The victims, known as the Jeff Davis Eight or the Jennings Eight, were eight women whose bodies were discovered in the swamps and canals surrounding the town. The state of decomposition of the bodies made it incredibly challenging to determine the exact cause of death, adding to the mystery and horror of the case. The first victim, Loretta Lewis, was found floating in a river by a fisherman on May 20, 2009. This tragic discovery marked the beginning of a series of murders that would grip the town for years to come. The other victims included Ernestine Marie Daniels Patterson, Kristen Gary Lopez, Whitney Dubois, Laconia Muggy Brown, Crystal Shea Benoit Zeno, Brittany Gary, and Nicole Guillory. Each of these women had their lives cut short in the most brutal and senseless manner. Author and investigative reporter Ethan Brown delved deep into the investigations surrounding the Jeff Davis Eight and uncovered a web of missteps and controversies within the local sheriff's office. In South Central Louisiana, a small town has been on edge for years. Eight young women known as the Jennings Eight were murdered over four years. No closure and no clues. Could police corruption be a reason why? As Brown's investigation unfolded, he uncovered a web of connections between the victims victims, the suspects, and the police. Many of the victims knew each other well, either through blood relations or shared living arrangements. They also shared common traits, such as poverty, mental illness, and histories of drug abuse and sex work. Tragically, these women not only faced the hardships of their circumstances, but also served as informants for the police, providing valuable information about the local drug trade and other victims before their own untimely deaths. What makes the Jeff Davis 8 case even more disturbing is the revelation that members of the local law enforcement were named as suspects by their own witnesses. Allegations of misconduct within the sheriff's office have further complicated the investigation. In an attempt to address the accusations against investigators, the sheriff ordered DNA testing for every investigator working on the Jeff Davis 8 case in 2009. However, the office has refused to comment on the results of the testing, leaving the families of the victims and the community in a state of uncertainty. Despite the arrests and warrants issued for suspects in connection with the case, progress has been slow and no one has been held accountable for the murders of Jeff Davis 8. The haunting question remains, who is responsible for these heinous crimes and will justice ever be served? the eastbound strangler. It was in the fall of 2006 when the city of Atlantic City was gripped by fear. Four women, all sex workers, met a gruesome fate at the hands of the eastbound strangler. Their bodies were discovered in a drainage ditch behind the now demolished Golden Key Motel, sending shockwaves through the community and captivating the nation. The victims, Molly Diltz, Kim Raffo, Barbara Brydor, and Tracy Roberts, were found face down in a row, their lifeless bodies arranged in a macabre display. Placed 60 feet apart from each other, they all shared a common fate death by strangulation. The eastbound strangler showed no mercy, leaving a chilling signature on their victims. Barbara V. Bredor, a 42-year-old sex worker who struggled with cocaine addiction, disappeared in October 2006. Her body was so badly decomposed that the cause of death could not be determined. Molly Jean Diltz, a 20-year-old originally from Blacklick, Pennsylvania, was the first victim to be killed. Despite not having a record for sex work, she was believed to be working in that industry at the time of her death. Kim Raffo, a 35-year-old former waitress from Canarsi, Brooklyn, had turned to sex work in Atlantic City. She was last seen alive a day before the bodies were discovered. The eastbound strangler's grip tightened around her throat, ending her life in a brutal act of violence. Tracy Ann Roberts, a 23-year-old former erotic dancer from Delaware, also fell victim to the eastbound strangler. She struggled with drug addiction and had been hit in the throat by a man who wished to be her pimp. 
Shortly before her disappearance, the Golden Key Motel, once a place of refuge for those seeking shelter, became a haunting crime scene. The eastbound strangler had chosen this location to carry out their heinous acts, leaving a lasting scar on the community. The investigation into the eastbound strangler's crimes was met with numerous challenges. Suspects came and went, but no one was ever named as a definitive suspect. Terry Olson, a repairman who was staying at the Golden Key Motel at the time of the murders, was implicated by his girlfriend during a domestic dispute. However, no DNA matches were found to connect him to the crimes. Eldred Raymond Birchall, who had confessed to killing people, was also considered a suspect, but no evidence linked him to the murders. In 2010, a possible connection between the eastbound strangler and the Gilgo Beach serial killings emerged. Law enforcement officials investigated the similarities between the two cases, hoping to uncover a link. However, this theory was later ruled out, leaving both cases as separate and unsolved mysteries. Over the years, various conspiracy theories have emerged, attempting to shed light on the identity of the eastbound strangler. Some speculate that multiple killers may be operating under the same moniker, while others believe that the true culprit has yet to be discovered. These theories add to the intrigue and mystery surrounding the case. The Smiley Face Killer The Smiley Face Killer stems from the Smiley Face murder theory that first emerged in the late 1990s when Gannon and Duarte began examining a series of mysterious deaths involving young men found dead in bodies of water across several Midwestern American states. These victims, often college-aged, athletic, and successful, had one thing in common. They had been last seen leaving bars or parties while under the influence of alcohol. It was during their investigation that Gannon and Duarte made a chilling discovery. Graffiti depicting a smiley face had been found near the locations where some of the bodies were recovered. This connection led them to theorize that these deaths were not accidental drownings, as concluded by law enforcement agencies, but the work of a serial killer or killers. The smiley face graffiti became a haunting symbol associated with the alleged murders. It seemed to taunt investigators, leaving behind a sinister signature at the scenes of these tragic crimes. The smiley face murder theory gained significant attention in 2008 when Gannon and Duarte published a textbook case study titled Case Studies in Drowning Forensics. This this publication brought their findings to a wider audience and ignited a heated debate among law enforcement agencies, experts, and the public. However, not everyone was convinced by the smiley face murder theory. Other police forces that had investigated similar deaths disputed the conclusion that these cases were linked. The La Crosse, Wisconsin Police Department, which had been in charge of eight of the investigations, concluded that the deaths were accidental drownings of inebriated men and found no evidence of smiley face symbols at any of the scenes. The Center for Homicide Research also published a research brief attempting to scientifically refute the theory. They argued that the smiley face graffiti found near the bodies did not match each other, suggesting that they were not drawn by the same killer. Additionally, they pointed out that the absence of physical trauma or drugging in most of the victims' cases indicated accidental drowning rather than foul play. The smiley face murder theory has also made its way into popular culture. In 2019, a docu-series titled Smiley Face Killers – The Hunt for Justice aired on the Oxygen Television Network, shedding light on the cases of young men who have disappeared and whose bodies were later found in bodies of water. The Federal Bureau of Investigation FBI, has also weighed in on the smiley face murder theory. In a statement, the FBI acknowledged the information provided by Gannon and Duarte, but stated that they have not developed any evidence to support the theory of a serial killer or killers. They believe that the majority of these instances appear to be alcohol-related drownings. The smiley face murder theory continues to captivate the public's imagination, raising questions about the existence of a smiley face killer and the nature of these unsolved cases. The debate surrounding these murders serves as a reminder of the complexities and challenges faced by law enforcement agencies in solving such crimes. The Chillicothe Killer. Three other women have been found dead in the area since last year, and two are still missing. All are from the Chillicothe area, and all of the women had a history of drug abuse. The case has sparked talk of a serial killer. In the quiet town of Chillicothe, Ohio, a series of disappearances and murders sent shockwaves through the community. Over 14 months between the spring of 2014 and the summer of 2015, several women vanished without a trace, leaving their families and the community in a state of fear and confusion. Four of the women were later found dead, their bodies showing signs of violence. Two others were never seen or heard from again. These cases, known as the Chillicothe Six, have remained unsolved, leaving a dark cloud of mystery over the community. The first woman to disappear was Charlotte Trago, a mother of two who had connections to sex work and battled a heroin addiction. She vanished in May 2014, and her whereabouts remain unknown. Tamika Lynch, a friend of Charlotte's, was reported missing on May 3, 2014. Her body was found three weeks later, and although the autopsy suggested a drug overdose, her family believes foul play was involved in her death. Wanda Lemons disappeared in November 2014, and her case remains open. 
Shasta Himmelrich went missing on Christmas Day 2014, and her body was found in the icy Scioto River a few days later. While her death was ruled a suicide, her family members believe she was murdered. Tiffany Sayre disappeared in May 2015, and her body was found in a creek weeks later, wrapped in a sheet. The last woman to disappear was Timberly Claytor, whose body was found near a vacant building, having been shot to death. As the disappearances of the Chillicothe Six sent shockwaves through the community, law enforcement agencies launched an extensive investigation to uncover the truth behind these haunting cases. The search for answers led them into the dark underbelly of drugs, sex work, and the potential for human trafficking. The investigation into the disappearances raised questions about whether a single serial killer was responsible or if a sex trafficking operation was preying on vulnerable women. Many of the women knew each other and were known to engage in drugs or sex work together, leading to speculation that they may have fallen victim to a larger criminal network. Despite the challenges, law enforcement agencies worked tirelessly to bring the perpetrators to justice. In July 2015, a breakthrough came when Jason McCrary, a convicted sex offender, was indicted for the murder of Timberly Clater, the last of the Chillicotha women to disappear. McCrary's accomplice, Ernest Dollar Bill Moore III, was also suspected of having information about the other missing and dead women. However, the complexity of the cases and the lack of concrete evidence linking McCrary and Moore to the other disappearances made it difficult to establish a definitive connection. The investigation took another turn when Neil Falls, a man suspected of being a serial killer, was killed in self-defense by a woman in Charleston, West Virginia. Falls had a list of 10 other women on his person, raising suspicions about his potential involvement in other killings. Given the proximity of West Virginia to Ohio, investigators explored possible connections to the Chillicothe cases, but no concrete links were established. Despite the tireless efforts of law enforcement, the cases of the Chillicothe Six remain unsolved. Chillicothe Police Chief Keith Washburn acknowledged the extensive investigation, stating, This is probably the most extensive investigation ever in this county. Yet, the truth remains elusive, leaving the community yearning for justice. The Chicago Strangler In the gritty streets of Chicago, a dark and sinister presence has cast a long shadow over the city for more than two decades. The Chicago Strangler, a name that strikes fear into the hearts of residents, is believed to be responsible for a series of chilling murders that have left a trail of devastation and unanswered questions. Since 1999, at least 50 women, predominantly black, have fallen victim to this elusive killer, their lives brutally taken in a disturbingly similar fashion. The story of the Chicago Strangler begins with a string of unsolved murders that occurred between 1999 and 2018. These victims, aged between 18 and 58, were found dumped in the desolate corners of Chicago's south and west side neighborhoods. Abandoned buildings and alleyways became the haunting crime scenes where these innocent women met their tragic fate. The eerie consistency in the locations of these murders is just the tip of the iceberg. What makes the Chicago Strangler case even more chilling is the brutal manner in which these women were killed. The killer showed no mercy, leaving a trail of unimaginable violence in their wake. Some victims were raped and beaten, their bodies bearing the scars of unspeakable cruelty. Others were bound, gagged, and left to suffer a horrifying fate. Plastic bags were often tied over their heads, suffocating them in a cruel twist of fate. Most disturbingly, the killer stripped these women of their clothing, leaving them vulnerable and exposed. In some cases, the killer even resorted to setting their lifeless bodies on fire, adding an extra layer of horror to an already gruesome crime. The victims of the Chicago Strangler were not just statistics. They were daughters, sisters, sisters, and mothers. Each death represented a unique tragedy, leaving behind shattered families and communities in mourning. In recent years, the Chicago Strangler case has gained renewed attention thanks in part to the efforts of Thomas Hargrove and the Murder Accountability Project, MAP. Hargrove, inspired by his study of serial killer Gary Ridgway, developed an algorithm to identify potential serial killers. Through his research, Hargrove has identified a striking pattern in the Chicago Strangler case. The victims were often recovered outdoors, in alleyways or abandoned properties, a rarity in most murder cases. Additionally, a clear sexual component was present in at least three quarters of the deaths, with the victims found partially or fully disrobed, their bodies exposed in a grotesque display of violence. Hargrove's algorithm has led him to believe that these 51 women were not killed by 51 separate individuals. Instead, he suggests that many of these women were victims of men who had been killed before. The chilling thought that a single killer may be responsible for the majority of these murders sends shivers down the spines of those following the case. The fact that the killing stopped in 2014, only to resume in 2017, further supports the theory that the Chicago Strangler may have been briefly incarcerated during this period. 
However, the Chicago police have been hesitant to accept Hargrove's theory. While they have reviewed his data, they remain unconvinced that the Chicago Strangler is an individual serial killer. According to the police, there is no concrete evidence to suggest an active serial killer, and the DNA collected from the crime scenes does not link the cases together. To date, only one of the 51 murders has been solved. Diamond Turner, whose life was tragically cut short, was killed by a man she had a relationship with. Like the other victims, she was asphyxiated and callously discarded. The lack of progress in solving the remaining cases has left a void in the hearts of the victims' families, who yearn for closure and justice. I-70 Killer It was the spring of 1992 when the infamous I-70 killings began, sending shockwaves through the heartland of America. The first victim, Robin Fuldauer, a 26-year-old manager at a Payless shoe source store in Indianapolis, would unknowingly become the catalyst for a series of brutal murders that would grip the nation. On that fateful day of April 8, 1992, Robin was diligently working alone at the store when an intruder entered. Little did she know that her life was about to be tragically cut short. The killer, armed with a chilling determination, took aim and fatally shot Robin in the back of the head. Her lifeless body was discovered later that day, hidden away in a storage room at the back of the store. The senseless act of violence left the community in shock and the police at a loss for answers, but the I-70 killer was just getting started. Three days after Robin's murder, the small town of Wichita, Kansas, would become the next hunting ground for this merciless predator. Patricia Smith, 23, and Patricia Magers, 32, were working at the La Bride d'Elegance bridal shop when tragedy struck. The I-70 killer's spree of violence continued, leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. On April 27th, Michael McCown, a 40-year-old employee at Sylvia's Ceramic Supply in Terre Haute, Indiana, fell victim to the killer's wrath. Michael, known for his ponytail and mistaken for a woman, was shot from behind while stocking shelves. The killer showed no mercy, taking Michael's life and leaving behind a grieving community. As the body count rose, the I-70 killer seemed unstoppable. Nancy Kitzmiller, a 24-year-old employee at Boot Village Shoe Store in St. Charles, Missouri, became his next victim. Working alone on May 3rd, Nancy was found dead, shot in the back of the head. The killer's brutality knew no bounds, and the community was left in a state of fear and disbelief. Just four days later, Sarah Blessing, a 37-year-old woman working at the store of Many Colors Holistic Shop in Raytown, Missouri, met a similar fate. All the victims shared a tragic commonality. They were killed execution-style, shot in the back of the head with the same gun, an Irma Worker Model ET-22 pistol. The I-70 killer's choice of victims seemed to revolve around young, petite brunette women, except Michael McCown, whose appearance may have led the killer to mistake him for a woman. The stores targeted were specialty shops, often robbed of small amounts of cash, suggesting that robbery was not the primary motive behind the killings. Authorities in those departments now believe all six of the murders are connected. The I-70 killer earned his chilling moniker due to the proximity of the murders to the I-70, a major east-west highway that runs through the heart of the Midwest. In recent years, the case has seen renewed interest and efforts to utilize advancements in DNA technology. The hope is that DNA evidence collected from the crime scenes can be reanalyzed, potentially leading to a breakthrough in identifying the killer. Investigators are also exploring the possibility of familial DNA searches, which could help identify relatives of the killer and narrow down the suspect pool. To this day, the I-70 killer's true identity remains unknown. The families of the victims continue to seek closure, haunted by the loss of their loved ones and the unanswered questions surrounding their deaths. The St. Charles Police Department, along with other law enforcement agencies involved in the case, urges anyone with information to come forward, offering a $25,000 reward for any leads that could lead to the identification and apprehension of the killer. The Long Island serial killings, also known as the Gilgo Beach murders, sent shockwaves through the community and captivated the nation. It all began on May 1, 2010, when 23-year-old Shannon Gilbert, who worked as an escort, made a frantic phone call to 911. She believed someone was after her and took off running, never to be seen again. As authorities searched for Gilbert, they stumbled upon a grim discovery in December 2010 near Gilgo Beach. Instead of finding Gilbert, they found the bodies of four women, later identified as Maureen Brainard Barnes, Amber Costello, Megan Waterman, and Melissa Barthelemy. These women, all petite and in their 20s, were working as online escorts. The similarities among the victims raised suspicions of a serial killer at work. The discovery of six more sets of remains in May 2011 brought the total to 10, including the Gilgo Four. The victims included Jessica Taylor, Valerie Mack, 
an unidentified toddler, an unidentified Asian male, and a victim nicknamed Peaches. The search for answers continued, and in December 2011, Shannon Gilbert's remains were found. However, investigators believe her death may have been accidental. The case remained unsolved for years, until a breakthrough in February 2022, when a new task force was formed. This led to the identification of a suspect, Rex Hoyerman, who was observed in areas connected to the burner phones used to contact the victims. DNA evidence and cell phone records linked Hoyerman to the murders, and he was arrested in July 2023. The arrest of Rex Hoyerman in July 2023 marked a significant turning point in the investigation into the Long Island serial killings. Hoyerman, a resident of Massapequa Park, Long Island, was charged with multiple counts of murder in connection with the deaths of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. While he is currently the prime suspect in the murder of Maureen Brainard Barnes, he has not been charged with her death. The breakthrough in the case came after a tip from the past. Amber Costello's roommate, Dave Schaller, had previously described one of Costello's clients as an ogre-like man driving a first-generation Chevrolet Avalanche. This description, along with the make and model of the vehicle, led investigators to take a closer look at Costello's phone records from 2010. They discovered that the client had made incessant calls to Costello before her disappearance. The investigation took a significant turn when authorities realized that the client was using a burner phone. They also discovered that the burner phones used to contact the victims were often in Massapequa Park, where Hoyerman lived, or Midtown Manhattan, where his architectural firm was located. With this crucial information, the task force narrowed their focus to Hoyerman as the prime suspect. Further evidence linking Hoyerman to the murders emerged when detectives recovered his DNA from a discarded pizza box in Midtown Manhattan. The DNA matched a male hair found on Megan Waterman's body. Alongside the DNA evidence, cell phone records provided additional proof of Hoyerman's connection to the burner phones used to contact the victims. Hoyerman pleaded not guilty to the charges during his arraignment in Suffolk County Court. He is currently being held without bail in a Suffolk County jail awaiting trial. While Hoyerman has not been charged in any additional investigations, the search for justice continues and authorities remain committed to uncovering the truth behind these heinous crimes. As we conclude our exploration of currently active serial killers, their heinous crimes serve as a haunting reminder of the darkness that can lurk within our society. If you enjoyed this video, click on the cards showing on your screens for more fascinating videos like this and I'll be waiting.